Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Kirsten Wiley, and I'm here today to introduce and welcome Daniel Jurgen, who is visiting us as part of the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. Daniel is here today to discuss his book, The Quest, Energy, Security, and the Remaking of the Modern World. Uh, it's actually on the New York Times bestseller list right now, so we are very lucky to have him speaking at Microsoft. The world's appetite for energy is growing. The absolute numbers are staggering. Billions of people are becoming part of the global economy, and as they do, their incomes and their use of energy go up. Energy and its challenges, where it comes from, who controls it, how it affects the planet, will continue to be a defining issue for our future. Daniel Jurgen is a highly respected authority on energy, international politics, and economics. He received the Pulitzer for his book, The Prize. He is the chairman of IHS Cambridge Energy Research Associates and serves as CNBC's global energy expert. Please join me in welcoming him to Microsoft. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I'm very pleased to be here and to be uh, part of this uh, event and uh, to speak here under the auspices of the Microsoft Research uh, Visiting Speakers uh, session. And uh, I have also actually want to particularly acknowledge uh, Curtis Wong uh, because he, when a uh, previous uh, book I'd done in television series was called Commanding Heights. And uh, it was kind of right at the kind of a transitional point in terms of the web and so forth. And I uh, continue to be very grateful to you for what you did in terms of driving to make sure that we had a web presence. And it's very interesting. We had a very highly rated uh, TV series called Commanding Heights. But it didn't take very long for it turned out that more people watched it uh, over the internet than over uh, PBS. And so it was part of that transition. And so I'm glad you're here today and to have the chance to meet you. So where I'd like to start is uh, not with the quest, but the prece preceding energy book I wrote, which was called The Prize. And a few days after Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, I, the, pr the prize went to press with these final words. Ours is a century in which every facet of civilization has been transformed by the modern and mesmerizing alchemy of petroleum. Ours truly remains the age of oil. Well, that was two decades ago. That was the 20th century. We're now in the 21st century. Uh, oil remains the world's most important commodity, uh, not only uh, fueling modern society, but in terms of global economics and in terms of global politics. But so much has changed in the world of energy uh, in so many different ways. Uh, and as I found is vividly evident to me in writing the, the prize, uh, writing the quest. First of all, uh, the Soviet Union no longer uh, exists. China, which was only, you know, a few words really in the prize, because at that time China was just a mi minor oil exporter, is now such a dominant factor in the world economy and world politics. And uh, indeed, China is the only country that gets two chapters of its own in the quest. So many other things happened. Climate change went from being an issue off to the side to being a major, uh, not only energy issue, but ec economic and political issue. Oil, which was supposed to be uh, $20 a barrel forever, went to $147.27. Uh, the U.S. was going to import vast amounts of liquefied natural gas. Instead, we have the shale gas revolution, which is changing the economics of the entire energy business. And then on top of all of that, uh, just this year, the dramatic and tragic uh, accident at Fukushima in Japan in the course of, of the tsunami. And at the same time, uh, the Arab Spring, which uh, has, as it unfolds, has such implications for energy. So there was a lot that happened. Uh, that uh, made it uh, very appropriate to try and make sense of the subject of energy. And that was the second thing. I really wanted to write not just about oil, but, uh, write, but write about the whole spectrum of energy. Uh, natural gas, electric power, renewables, efficiency, climate change, and put it all together in a narrative and a story. And so all of those factors came together 
uh, as I set out to um, write this new book called The Quest. Now, this, this story is populated by a host of very interesting characters, some of them well known to uh, everyone and some of them not well known and yet very influential. And I thought I'd just give you a flavor of them. Many of them, interestingly, are innovators, researchers, scientists in one form or another. And uh, one of the uh, Planet Money on, uh, on NPR actually kind of talked about the role of, the important role that geeks play in, uh, in this particular story. To just give you uh, uh, some examples, there's a professor at Caltech named Ari Hagen-Smith. And uh, he was a great uh, expert on kind of the chemistry of foods. Uh, he had figured out the, where the flavor of onions and garlic and wine came from. He was a man who achieved uh, immortal status as identifying the active agent in marijuana. Uh, and he was fascinated and obsessed with trying to understand the flavors in pineapple, where that, where that sweet flavor came from. And he was researching that one day in his lab at Caltech in Pasadena when he walked outside, I suspect, to have a smoke. And instead of the clear, beautiful California weather, which had helped to bring him to California, he felt in his lungs what he called that stinking cloud of, of smog. And he said, well, at that time, there's a huge debate as to what smog was and what caused it. He said, I can figure this out. And he said he got it on the first nickel, and he identified the cause of it. He became known as the father of smog, which irritated him a great deal because he said, who is the mother of smog? But uh, he then later, when the California Air Resources Board was set up, which has now become kind of like almost the regulator of the world automobile industry, he was the first chairman appointed by Ronald Reagan. And he went on from that to uh, uh, continue to do research on all of this. And you could kind of draw a line from when Ari Hagen-Smith walked out of his lab in 1948 to the appearance of the electric car on the road today. So that's one character uh, in the book. Another is a man named Haider Aliyev. Probably not many will know, a few know his name. Uh, he was a KGB general. He rose to the top of the Soviet Union. He was in the Politburo until he had a fight with Mikhail Gorbachev and was exiled back to his native Azerbaijan. It looked like things were over. Soviet Union collapses. He emerges as uh, no longer a Soviet man, but a native son, the first native son, president of Azerbaijan, and more than anybody else is responsible for yoking Central Asia and the Caspian Sea back into the world economy where they had once been. Somebody else who's important is um, a, a young man. You know, we know many people are graduating from university today. Uh, with very good degrees for having trouble finding jobs. And this particular individual also had trouble finding a job. Uh, he, in fact, was reduced to tutoring, sort of like Kaplan style. And uh, he uh, even, even then, to, he actually offered free samples of tutoring, trying to get business. His father wrote a letter to a chemistry professor and said, my son grows unhappier day by day. He feels that his career has been permanently derailed. This young man was Albert Einstein. Uh, he then found a job in the patent office in Bern in Switzerland. It was not very taxing. Uh, it was a very slow summer. So over 10 weeks, one summer in 1905, he wrote five papers that changed the world. One of them was a paper on photoelectricity, for which is what he won the Nobel Prize. And that became the basis of the solar industry that we have today. It took 50 years from that paper to get the first solar cells up on satellites in, co in competition with the Soviets uh, after Sputnik was launched. And here we are now, 106 years later, and solar is still kind of finding its way. So one of the things it tells you is long lead times in the energy business. Um, the, um, I'll mention one, uh, two other people, I think, who are just of interesting. One is, I, I can assure you that this is the only book ever written on energy that will talk about the worst moment in Ronald Reagan's career as an actor. And that moment was uh, when he couldn't get work as an actor and was reduced to doing stand-up comedy fronting a singing group called the Continentals in Las Vegas. Uh, he came back to L.A., thought his career was finished. Phone rings. It's his agent on the phone, says, you know, Ronnie, I have a great 
new job for you, and he goes to work as the spokesman for General Electric. Now, and there's a wonderful picture in the book of, of Reagan and his wife Nancy demonstrating this amazing, incredible new invention called a portable radio. And that was not that long ago. But the reason I talk about him in the book is because it's a way of talking about the great shift that happened in America when a society after World War II, we got electrified. Uh, his, you know, Nancy Reagan talked to one of the, the ads for General Electric about this amazing new electric servant, a vacuum cleaner. It was really, I mean, all these things that we now take for granted. And what unfolded in the U.S. in the 50s and into the 60s is now what's unfolding in China and other emerging markets. We had 10 or 11 percent annual growth in electricity. Now uh, they do. And their struggles with that is uh, part of what is the current drama of world energy. I'll mention one last character who also has a uh, picture in the book, a man named Jim Delson, who spent New Year's Eve 1981 atop a wind turbine in a blizzard in the Tehachapi Pass in California, trying to get his turbine up by midnight because at midnight the tax credits expired, and so uh, the economics depended very highly on this. He thought there has to be a better way to do this, and so he goes off to Europe and discovers that, goes to Denmark and discovers that much sturdier wind turbines are made in Denmark, and they are made by companies that came out of this very sturdy, hardy Danish agricultural machinery industry. And he imports them, and for a time, uh, really, the California wind industry in California in the 1980s was the epicenter of the world wind industry were these Danish uh, wind turbines. And so part of what I tried to do in the book is not only look to the future, to the kind of question you said about how we supply a world of, of, that will be eight and a half or nine billion people with energy, but also how did things happen? So I came to the conclusion that the modern wind industry, not the wind industry that goes back to Persia and, and Don Quixote and everything, but the modern wind industry really owes its existence to the, to the marriage of the Danish agricultural, industri agricultural machinery industry and California tax policy. And it's out of that that we have the modern wind industry. Well, these are some of the stories. And you know, as I thought and as I was coming here, and uh, so many of you are involved in research, re realize that this is really a, uh, the role of the innovators of technological innovation, of people seeing different ways to do things, being able to act upon it, is one of the main themes and stories that runs through this book. But there are three big questions that defined the story for me as I was working on it over these past five years. One is we have a $65 trillion world economy, after the downturn and growth resumes, might be a $130 trillion economy in 20 years, a couple decades. Where does the energy come for that? So that was first question. Second question was uh, security. Energy security, both in its classic sense, disruptions, concerns, for instance, about, you know, uh, we've had a civil war uh, in Libya that has disrupted supplies. Uh, we've had disruptions before in the Middle East, but also new kind of disruptions and uh, described by the CEO of Sony after a attack on their website as the bad new world of cyber vulnerab vulnerability. And that is uh, a question for the critical infrastructure of the energy industry. And then the third question is, uh, how do you put together the world's need for energy with the world's environmental objectives? And not a simple answer to that. So all of those together uh, formed the, the, the three questions that I kept knocking up against, I kept running into as I was shaping my story. The big themes are, one is geopolitics, which is just uh, always has been and always seems to be part of the uh, energy business. And it's, this theme runs throughout the book. Uh, geopolitics was a critical part of the, what people called the Caspian Derby, this bracing competition for who was going to have the control of oil, natural gas, the countries after the breakup of the Soviet Union in the arena of the Caspian and the um, uh, Central Asia. Uh, I sec certainly, the geopolitics of energy is, is fundamental in the relationship between the United States and China. And that relationship overall is so important uh, to the future of the world and certainly to the future of the two countries. And uh, energy, we can talk some more about that. One way or the other, Iran's nuclear program will have a major impact on world energy markets. 
Uh, indeed, we can see uh, in, in so many different ways now this sort of sense of rising tension and the tension between Iran and Saudi Arabia played out in Syria, played out in Iraq, uh, played out in Bahrain, played out in Yemen, uh, and add to that the uh, recent uh, plot to uh, assassinate the Saudi Ar uh, Arabian ambassador at a restaurant in Washington, D.C., that the U.S. government traces back to the Iranian government, and hanging over all uh, Iran's nuclear program. So those whole set of geopolitical issues uh, very much will have a major impact on what happens to energy. Indeed, also, um, we've now passed beyond the Arab Spring, and now it's a challenging work of, uh, of reforming societies, reforming economies, reforming the legitimacy of government. But one thing we do know is that the, that the, that the consequences of the Arab Spring upended the strategic balance which has underpinned uh, at least semi-stability in the Middle East and thus the stability of energy supplies. And we're still in the early stages to see how the new balance uh, develops and that will be, have big implications for energy. Now this geopolitics uh, of energy is accentuated by something else, a new demand for energy. Demand for energy that's coming from what used to be called the developing world and today are called the emerging markets. Uh, one way to express it in the term I came up with to try and describe it is the globalization of energy demand. That just like everything else gets globalized, so has uh, demand. And to kind of give you a sense of it, to show you how it's changing, if we went back to 2000, two-thirds of world oil demand was used in the developed countries, North America, Western Europe, Japan. Today it's 50-50 between the developed countries, developing emerging markets, and it's going to shift and the developing countries are going to be using more, uh, more oil. And, and that's going to be accentuated by what we're going to have in our country, which is a term that I use in the book, uh, peak demand. That is, we've reached a point where our oil demand is going to go down, partly because everybody is going to be driving more efficient cars. But by 2025, they're supposed to get 54 miles per gallon new cars compared to 30. And also demographic changes have occurred as well. So all of those things mean our demand is actually going down while it's going up on the other direction. And, you know, the, when you look at the whole picture, one thing really stands out. You won't be surprised. It's to use a real estate term, the build out of China. You have 20 million people a year at least moving from countryside to city. They need housing. They need jobs, they need transportation, and all of that requires energy. And we can see it happening. China already uses more energy total than the United States. Much of that is coal, but increasing part of it will be uh, oil. And its growing demand for oil it seems to be just locked in. It's going to continue to unfold. Let me give you uh, just something that will make it very vividly clear. Let's again go back to the year 2000. In 2000, the United States, in the United States, 17 million new cars were sold. China, less than 2 million were sold. Okay, now we go to 2010. China, 17 million cars, 11 million in the United States, and it's thought that the Chinese number could go up to 25 million or even more. And so all of that will be reflected in, uh, in, in, in oil needs. Now, uh, some see an inevitable competition for resources developing. I think it's very, and you can see how that could happen, but I think it's very important that it actually not happen and that there be the emphasis on the common interest between the United States and China as consumers, interest in stable markets, and indeed how interconnected the two countries are. Let me turn to uh, another th theme uh, in the book, which is technology. And... Uh, and this really does get to the questions of innovation, the kind of issues that many of you are very involved with. And it is so striking that innovations that were dreams or theories or science experiments, to use a term that is used in Silicon Valley, in one decade, a couple decades later, just become part of the accepted uh, normal part of the energy world. And we see it again and again. One place that is unfolding is in what's called shale gas which is associated with uh, that word that has now become well-known, fracking. 
Uh, it was only in about 2008 that it became evident that this was a major new resource. Yet it had been 25 years in development, but it burst on the scene in 2008. And in some ways, it might even be described as the biggest energy innovation of the last couple of decades, at least in terms of its scale, in terms of its impact. It's 30% of our natural gas production now. It's a number that is uh, certainly going to uh, continue to go up. And it has, um, it's changing kind of the whole economics of the energy sphere. It's affecting the competitive position of everything from nuclear to wind. Now, uh, it's very interesting on oil, uh, kind of the familiar old energy resource, one has seen major innovations. And if you look at it in a hemispheric way, sort of quite striking innovations, actually. There are three that are kind of changing almost the map of, of world oil. One, and they all are the result of breakthroughs, technological innovation. And they're basically all things that are post uh, 21st century in terms of their real impact. One is what's called the oil sands in Canada, which now produces much oil as Libya produced, uh, exported before the Civil War began. Uh, Canada is by far now the largest source of U.S. oil imports and continuing to go up. The second is what the Brazilians call pre-salt, which is uh, it took uh, incredible computing power. Uh, and uh, as the president of the state oil company says, uh, uh, amazing algorithms to solve the problem of identifying the oil that rested beneath these very thick band of salt. And Brazil is now on its road to being a powerhouse of world oil. By the end of the, this decade, it could be producing twice as much as Venezuela, which has always been thought of as the big Latin American oil uh, country. The third change is here, homegrown in the United States. It's uh, what's called tight oil or shale oil. It's the application of the same technology that brought you shale gas uh, to oil. And it has turned uh, North Dakota into the fourth largest oil producing state in the country. And also, I checked last night, the state with the lowest unemployment rate uh, in the country. And uh, we're seeing that in other parts of the country too. And so it's also, this is also an area of substantial growth. And so you now have an oil boom back in the United States, which people hadn't uh, expected to see again. So that's technology at work there. Technology certainly at work in terms of uh, what I call in the quest the rebirth of renewables. Because you had the kind of modern renewable industry began in the 70s, early 80s. Then it entered what people in the industry, and some of you may know people or have been part of it, called the Valley of Death because uh, it was the economics turned so adversely against it. Price of oil collapsed, no one seemed to care. And then around 2000, it began to change. It was not only for general environmental reasons, not only for security reasons, but two other factors came into play. One is climate change and concern about climate change, moving from a minor issue to a major issue. And then the growth that I was talking about before in terms of uh, the emerging markets and suddenly seeing there was going to be much more energy demand and seeing renewables as part of the solution to that. So you had people come into the energy business who were not there before. And in the chapter called The Science Experiment uh, in the Quest, I talk about how venture capital found its way into, uh, into the energy business. And I quote one of the pioneers of venture capital in uh, renewable new energy, in fact, one of the funders of Tesla, uh, the electric car. But he said in the 90s, when he was making this investment, his friends uh, thought he was committing career suicide, that it was you know, all over. But uh, he stuck with it. And around 2004, Silicon Valley in general started to move in it, to it. And you sort of saw the kind of ecosystem of innovation uh, at work in the renewable sector that you hadn't, uh, hadn't really seen before. So today, I think if you look at the green company industries, they're actually big businesses. Last year, about a third of the installed capacity in dollar terms in electric power around the world was, uh, uh, was actually renewable energy. But it's interesting that they're big businesses, but they're also small when you compare them against the overall scale of the energy industry in its totality. And so the need for the renewables is to st establish that they're competitive at scale. And I think that's the kind of game that's being uh, played out right now. But you look at the wind business, a wind turbine today is a very different wind turbine uh, than one in the 1980s and might produce 100 times more electricity. So uh, an enormous amount of uh, progress has been made. 
and we see the progress in solar and the name of the game there is just to drive down costs, drive down costs. We've also seen, of course, the migration of a lot of the manufacturing to China because of the advantages <coughs> that they have in China in terms of low-cost manufacturing. But so the view that I have in the book, and I think you'll find it's really the story again, where did solar come from, where did wind come from, uh, is to try and understand the, um, the dynamics and therefore kind of some sense of the pacing at change, although always with the sense that there are can innovations that can come and surprise us and come from left field. And, you know, although it's now sort of off the table, I would certainly say keep your eyes on what happens in terms of biotech and energy. Uh, the other major theme is uh, environmental considerations. And as you know, environmental considerations are challenging the very notion of a future based on fossil fuels. Government policies are either looking for low carbon sources like natural gas or no carbon sources like um, wind and solar. And there too, I got very interested in the question, how did climate change go from being this very peripheral question to being such a dominating question? And I thought I was going to write just one chapter on it. I actually ended up writing six chapters on it because it was so interesting. And I found myself starting actually the story in the Alps in the 1770s and then in the 19th century finding scientists who, you know, it's kind of one thing leads to another. Uh, around 18, the 1830s, a famous scientist named Louis Agassiz kind of figured out that there had actually been something called an ice age that had preceded the current age. And people were then, too, fascinated with glaciers and started saying, if, well, if there had been an ice age, how do we know that another ice age isn't going to come back and the glaciers are not going to migrate down again and uh, destroy civilization? And so a lot of the climate research that was the original climate research in the 19th century was about the fear of a return of, uh, of, of, of glaciers. And one of the most famous scientists, uh, Arrhenius, who uh, identified you know, how carbon could make uh, the climate warmer, he was a Swede. Um, he was depressed by those long, dark nights uh, and the long, dark winters. And he actually thought it would be great uh, if there was global warming, because uh, it would make Sweden a verdant paradise of, uh, of crop growing. Uh, so, but it was really only in the 1950s and 1960s when, again, another key scientist, another key tenacious, obsessive individual uh, named Keeling, who had done his PhD at Caltech, went to Scripps and began measuring carbon that you start to see the beginning of the consensus that now uh, drives climate policy. Uh, just a couple of other things on other environmental considerations. Up till March 10th, one would have been talking about a nuclear renaissance because it seemed that everywhere around the world, you know, Chernobyl, the accident of Chernobyl was long forgotten. Chancellor Merkel, the German uh, Chancellor, uh, Angela Merkel, was pushing for Germany to reverse its policy and commit to a more important role for nuclear in its future. Then came that terrible accident at Fukushima, and she led the change in Germany to say we're going to shut down our nuclear industry by 2022. Uh, and we see instead of a nuclear renaissance now, we see a nuclear patchwork. Some countries going ahead, China, Russia, some countries uh, uh, highly undecided. Really, Japan is quite undecided itself about what it wants to do. In the United States, the Obama administration has said that they want to continue to uh, pursue nuclear because it's seen as the only large-scale carbon-free electricity, and there are a couple of projects that are uh, going ahead. I would say that also local pollution, although not so much in the developed countries, in developing countries, is certainly driving energy innovation. And nowhere, of course, more than China, where the air is, is so difficult and so painful to breathe and it makes the smog of Los Angeles uh, look mild by comparison. And so in China, a very strong drive for uh, cleaner energy technologies. Now, I kind of bring the story of the quest together around two, two subjects. One is what's called the fifth fuel sometimes, i.e. energy conservation or energy efficiency. Um, I've always thought, and I continue to think, it is actually the biggest potential near-term supply that we have. Uh, and in fact, when people say, oh, we've made no progress in energy efficiency, that's actually not correct. As a country, we're twice as energy efficient today as we were in the 1970s and the early 1980s. And it might be a legitimate, reasonable national strategy to try and double it again. The problem is, how do you make it vivid? 
and it was summarized for me by the European Union's uh, energy commissioner when he was extolling the virtues of efficiency and trying to promote it, but saying his problem about promoting against renewables is that you just don't have any good photo ops uh, for energy efficiency, or what he said is actually there's no red ribbon to cut. And so I think that continues to be a, actually a, an obstacle, and yet the impact of it can be enormous. Now, I didn't think when I was going to, um, when I started the book, that I would finish where I finished it. But I finished it on the question of what kind of car you and everybody watching will be driving in 10 or 20 years. Is it indeed going to be an electric uh, vehicle? Or is it going to be a highly efficient internal combustion engine that gets 60 or 70 miles to the gallon? Will it be hybrids? Uh, what's, what's the mix going to be? And the truth is, I don't think we know. Certainly, this uh, arrival of the electric car is quite a, a, a major development. It, takes, it reconnects the beginning of the 20th century with the beginning of the 21st century because we had, there was a race between the electric car and the gasoline-powered car at the beginning of the 20th century. Indeed, there's a wonderful picture in the book of a painting of Thomas Edison and Henry Ford having dinner together where Ford is uh, telling Edison about his electric car uh, his, not his electric car, his gasoline-powered car. And uh, Edison says, you know, that's a great idea. And he, and he says, that hydrocarbon that you want to use, that's a really good fuel. But then a couple of years later, Edison, 180 degrees, changes his mile, doesn't like the pollution, says we can do it with an electric battery, spends a lot of time and money trying to get an electric car going. But Ford comes out with the uh, Model T, $895 without the top. Mm -hmm. And uh, lo and behold, um, the race seems to be over. And here we are, 2011, looking into 2012, and the race has begun again. Uh, there's a great set of two pictures in the quest. One is of a woman charging a car in 1910, and the other is the CEO of uh, uh, Nissan Renault with their charging a Leaf uh, in 2010. And it's sort of the pictures, I put them together because they almost look like identical pictures, and sort of saying this race has begun again, but it's still very early stages, and I would think it would be four or five years before we have clarity about what kind of scale is going to uh, be achieved, and it will be something that will obviously have very broad-ranging significance. Now, in writing the quest, I recognized that there will be surprises, uh, that there will be new developments. There are always these, quote, surprises that come along when everybody has a consensus and agrees where things are going, and it goes in a different direction. And uh, they may be technology, they may come out of labs, they may be politics, they may be the result of economics. We don't know. There's, by definition, there's surprises, although you can spend some time working with scenarios and other things to try and see what they might be. But even as these surprises occur and changes occur, I hope that the quest will provide a perspective on how our energy world has become what it is, uh, how, what our energy world may look like in the future, and how to prepare for it. You know, you come to the end of writing a book, and you've got to go back and write two key parts. One is the introduction, to set it all out, because you've learned a lot. Your thinking has changed over the five years you've worked on it. And you have to write the conclusion to tie it together. Where do you want to leave people? Where do you want to leave readers? Where is your thought at the end of it? And I'd come across a quote by a man named uh, Sadi Carnot. Uh, engineers will know his name because of the Carnot cycle, describing how a steam engine works. Uh, he laid it out in 1824 in a paper titled, Reflections on the Motive Power of Fire. Uh, he wrote that the invention of heat engines using what he called combustibles was producing a great revolution for humanity. Now, Carnot, Sadi Carnot is very interesting because he's not only a scientist and engineer, he was also a soldier. His father, in fact, had been minister of war for Napoleon. And he looked on the steam engine not only from an engineer's point of view, but also from a soldier's point of view, from a geopolitics point of view, because he said that Britain had bested, had defeated France, partly because of its mastery of energy technology. And he saw his mission was to teach the French about this technology to kind of right the geopolitical balance. And I thought that is really interesting because, you know, even at that stage, the geopolitics uh, was part of the energy picture. 
But I, as I looked at the quest, and I looked at uh, the people I'd written about and the developments I did and how these stories unfolded, I concluded, and you may rightly conclude when you read the quest, that indeed uh, uh, a great revolution, that phrase of Carnot, fairly describes uh, the entire process of innovation, of harnessing energy that began in the 18th century. And this is clearly a revolution uh, that will continue into the future. And indeed, I conclude is that this, and it's why I conclude that this is a quest, this particular quest, this quest around energy, is a quest that will never end, and is a quest that never should end. Thank you. Would you like a little discussion? Sure. You mentioned increasing uh, fuel economy standard for cars. Now, we've been there before. In the 70s, they had fuel efficiency standard for car. So, Africa invented the minivan. Then they had fuel efficiency standard for minivans, and, and somebody invented the SUV, which is a truck. And uh, don't you think they probably invent some new name and get around it a third time? Well, first of all, you're quite right. And it's actually one of the fascinating things I had was going back saying, where did the minivan come from? And it was kind of an odd idea that Chrysler had. And in the early 1990s, on the ba basis of its uh, progress with the minivan, people called Chrysler the most successful automobile company in the world. And uh, indeed, I talked to the former CEO of General Motors, and he talked about how General Motors was trying to catch up with minivans and trying to meet the demand for SUVs. Uh, partly, Detroit went in that direction because once gasoline prices went down, then consumers, so Detroit had to make these efficient cars, but consumers weren't buying them. And thus, and of course, the reason trucks, as they were called, minivans, SUVs, had different fuel efficiency standards because, you know, no one drove them in the 70s unless you had a work reason for driving them. And then, you know, the invention of the, the appearance of the soccer mom and it became a whole, you know, and at one point, half the new vehicles being sold were these kind of cars. And America's love affair with the automobile turned into a mad passion for the SUV. Uh, but it was clearly connected to low gasoline prices. The great, you know, the highest sales were at the end of the 1990s when in inflation-adjusted terms, uh, gasoline was cheaper than it actually ever been. So I think that, um, you know, I think people are onto it now. And I think that the fuel efficiency standards have been rewritten, have been written in such a way that they apply to those as well. So I think the whole fleet's going to move in that direction. And I think I see Detroit, the ethos has changed. Uh, and you can see the cars, of, the focus on efficiency. Now, if everybody changes their mind and don't care about it again, then you could kind of have another crunch. But it seems to me it's more widely locked into uh, kind of, as somebody says in the quest, the, the DNA uh, of thinking about it. But that is um, Detroit's fear is the volatility on the part of the consumer. How do you see the end game for oil playing out? And in what time frame? If you could even think that far. By the end game? The end game as in like when we stop, when we stop burning oil to, uh, to transport, us, transport ourselves around or make energy. Well, you know, kind of think out to 2030. Once you get beyond that, it gets awfully hazy. Uh, I think that uh, one picture would be that we reach a kind of plateau sometime around the middle of the century, and then we get what we get in the U.S. peak demand and decline. We start to get it on a, on a global basis. If the electric car, uh, other forms of transportation come on more strongly and can economically displace the automobile that could happen more quickly, then you have the problem about how you generate your electricity. But um, so I see it as a sort of um, not a, um, a sharp change, but a long goodbye. What about for aviation? Is there anything on the horizon? That well, the uh, Defense Department uh, is trying to create, uh, uh, and I, when you talk about oil, are you, you're not thinking, you're putting biofuels in a different category. Yes. Right. Yes. Certainly the uh, Defense Department is promoting uh, and trying to develop a drop in biofuels that would replace uh, jet fuel. And so that's an area in which a fair amount of research is going on it. The Secretary of Navy talks about a great green fleet and that 
wants to be half of uh, the Navy's uh, energy coming from non-oil by 2020, which is a very ambitious goal. So kind of one of the drivers there is uh, the uh, Defense Department. And also, of course, they're just aware these convoys where people get attacked and so forth, many of them are bringing oil. So it's, uh, uh, are there other ways, kind of other ways to use energy? So I think, in, as so often happens, that actually uh, defense military may be a major source of innovation. I have in, in the quest the story of how Churchill converted the British Navy, Royal Navy, from coal to oil, specifically to gain speed and flexibility against the German fleet. And so I think, uh, I think that will be a source, actually a source of innovation. Do you discuss hydropower? Um, I don't discuss it much. I mean, obviously, um, it's interesting if you look. Last year, about 8% of U.S. energy was renewables. If you go back to 1985, about 8% was renewables. But it was a much larger segment of hydropower. I think it's quite difficult to build large dams. And so it's kind of low head hydro is, you know, but it, it doesn't seem to be a growth area. I don't know if you had a specific thought that you had. It's, it's one of these technologies that's been around for a long time, but it's, it's sort of not really considered renewable the same way solar and, and wind are. Uh, in yeah, it would be, it'd be very difficult to build any large dam in the United States, and some would like to see some of the dams taken down. So, sure. yeah, it's, it's, it's not. There was a period of great interest in small hydro, but even that involves damming rivers and so forth, and so there's controversy about it. Uh, for emerging markets, what are your uh, thoughts around India's uh, energy needs? And do you see renewable sources like maybe solar, with warmer uh, climates being a way out, or how do you see them? Going? Well, it's interesting. One of the um, innovators that I profile is a, an Indian wind tycoon. And he started the, going into the wind business basically because of the shortage of, of electricity, that factories were shut down for five hours a day because they didn't have power. And here he could offer a solution to people. So uh, I think, and, uh, you, you know, so fair amount of interest in renewables in India and entrepreneurship are around it. And India does have these formidable Indian institutes of technology, which, you know, really turn out first-class talent. So I, I don't see the same kind of f focused direction from the top that you see in China. But clearly, a lot of, you know, entrepreneurial energy going in that. And Suzlon is one of the major uh, wind companies of the world, and its, its foundations are in India. Whatever became of the hydrogen economy that we were promised a couple of decades. Well, I think you had a speaker here. Oh, we might have. D didn't you? Uh, did you have <coughs> Jeremy Rifkin? No. No. Oh, oh you didn't say. Yeah. Um, it was, um, it's kind of one of those things that's always out there. And, uh, you know, I remember in, at one point we were going to have a, a conference we do every year in, in, Houston, we were going to have a Secretary of Energy speak, and he was going to speak about hydrogen, and we just said, you know, you might want to use the word long term. So it just before it, so it always seems to be out there. You mentioned your, your fit fuel being efficiency. Um, already seeing in the U.S. sort of some distortions in, or some real incentives from utility companies with their tariff setting because the their demand is coming down. They're focused more on peak shaving than they are on reducing use. And, and along with that, you're seeing some consumer pushback or, or uh, rate payer intervention, rate setting intervention, interventions from people who don't like the fact that so much more of their base charges is just going to be to do infrastructure recovery rather than the variable cost recovery. It's, it's almost a distortion like what happened to the wireline phone companies or that business just crumbled pretty quickly. Well, I think it is a challenge for utilities. How do you turn energy efficiency, define it as an energy source, and then make, you know, make, make money from it? How do you design rates to do that? Um, there was a lot of enthusiasm about smart grid, even you know, until fairly recently. But then it turned out that one of the ways that you would you know, you would promote greater efficiency with, with variable rates. 
time of day, and it turns out a lot of people don't like that. They want to have predictable rates, and uh, certainly in the West, there's been some real rebellion against it. So you, you don't see quite the uh, excitement. But the basic thing is that it should be create a situation where it's neutral for utilities, uh, whether they're investing in new generation or whether they're investing in efficiency, because you get the same impact. And I think, in general, utilities would prefer not to build new capacity because it's expensive and so forth. One thing we do see is that um, you know, oil demand may be going down, but at least in our view, electricity demand continues to go up. And one of the reasons is, which you all know, servers and, uh, uh, and just the proliferation of gadgets. And uh, so we talk in the, I talk in the quest about gadget watts and uh, those need to be supplied. Because if you go back to Ronald Reagan day, the amount of electricity used in a home was pretty limited to you know, just a, a few different things. And today, you know, just think all the things you have to keep charged all the time. So, so I wonder when, <laughs> by the way, I drove to this speech uh, in a Nissan Leaf. So uh, tell us about it. Uh, it's fantastic. Um, and actually, you know, one of my questions when you're talking to the audio executives you know, in the PC industry, there's something that we call the, the Osborne effect, where um, Osborne Computer said, hey, just wait, we're going to have this fantastic computer. And they went out of business mm -hmm. because everyone waited for that next fantastic computer. And so I'm wondering if any of the audio executives have an answer for how do you keep talking about these fantastic cars, the electric cars that are coming out, and not put people in a position where they say, well, that would be great, so maybe I should just put off buying a car. Right. By the way, do, do the questions get picked up for the... Uh, yes. Oh, they do? Yeah. Right, good. Um, the, um, um, I'm thinking about the Osborne effect. Uh, and so your question is that rather than waiting for the perfect car, uh, can you just ask the question again? Well, yeah, I mean, if I were to expand it, like I, I have some people respond as I talk about how how fast and peppy this car is and how many miles it gets and how cheap it is to refuel it with electricity, recharge it. Uh, one of the things I've had people say is, well, I'll wait till they have a longer range or mm -hmm. I'll wait till um, a bigger vehicle or, you know, there are lots of different features that are important to people. Um, and so you, you have two sides, which is, you know, one side is getting people on to buying something that they've never bought and they're not familiar with. And the other is um, discouraging people from buying the product that you currently make, which is, of course, a gas-powered car. So, you know, I know there's kind of a delicate balance between yeah. those two and where you put your marketing dollars. And I, I wondered if they had sort well, of... Well, I think it varies from... Uh, I think all the companies, I mean, not only... I mean, what's interesting is you are getting a positive consumer response. I s spoke the other day at a of all places, an automotive museum in Los Angeles, and there was a guy there who was actually in a business of uh, refurbishing Corvettes, and he couldn't stop raving about his Chevy Volt and about how much he loved it. And I thought, God, it's culturally very interesting. Uh, so I think you are getting early adapters, early users, and that feedback, I mean, we're now in that stage, we'll, we'll feed back. I find among the automakers, there's a kind of range of views. I talked to Carlos Ghosn from uh, Nissan Renault, and he is, um, you know, he is gung ho and feels this is the future and uh, push push ahead on it. Uh, I have Bill Ford in the book though, who says we don't really know what the car in ten years is going to be, so we have to play on all fronts. And the same with uh, Daimler, because I think the the general thing you hear is that the cost of the battery has to come down. You still have a car whose price is, you know, you're not really reflected in it. And there are a lot of you got a seventy five hundred dollar tax credit, et cetera. So that's why I say we're in this kind of period. But I think the feedback and people, you know, this person, that person hearing what you're going to say, they're going to be, feel more comfortable uh, thinking about it too. And so we'll kind of see what the demand is. I mean, hybrids, you know, have been out now for uh, 10 years and they're still a relatively small part of the mix. I know some automobile makers actually think the hybrid is really truly the way it to go. Uh, so I think it's still a, a testing period, but um, I think everybody in the room is actually very interested in your experience, which it sounds like you would describe it as positive. Yeah, very positive. 
positive. Yeah. yeah. What made you decide to buy it? Uh, I'm an experimenter. I mean, I'm sure everyone in this room we're all gadget crazy. So I mean, it's very much a technology gadget. If you think about it. Yeah. But would you have bought it without the tax credit? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, you think anybody else would have? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, it's relatively affordable. I mean, it's not like the hydrogen cars that are out there that are a million dollars. Yeah, or cars. even the you know a te Tesla Roadster. I mean, it's a good deal more expensive. So, yeah. well, I think this is really interesting. I mean, I think these are the data points that uh, you know they're early adapters, later adapters, but and it will partly depend upon kind of the enthusiasm. I think that, by the way, if you don't actually, I mean, we, the psychology of global energy markets, even if there are not a lot of electric cars, if there are enough of them, people are satisfied with them, that will start to change psychology because what it will say is you have a system that's not primarily almost totally dependent upon oil. There are alternatives. Then you'll get into the question of how the electricity is produced and all those other questions. But uh, thank you for the comment. So I think there and then we'll come to you. If we decide that we need to walk away from nuclear energy altogether, I mean, how far how far away are we from being able to replace all of our fossil fuel energy needs with you know renewable energy? Mm. I mean, my my question is, can we really, as a global economy, say nuclear energy is too dangerous, or would we well, ever be able to get away? Well, I think it's well, it's twenty percent of our electricity. It's about thirty percent of Japanese electricity. Uh, I think it's uh, it's obviously almost 80 percent of French electricity, 77 percent. So I think um, it's I think it is embedded in the mix. Uh, I, by the way, one of the other great characters is a man who's probably more responsible for nuclear energy than anybody else in the book, uh, Admiral Hyman Rickover. A few of you will know his name, many won't, but he was the father of the nuclear navy and the father of nuclear power. And it's you know you do look back on it, it was actually done rather remarkably quickly, actually far quicker than people thought would be possible. Uh, there's some interest in small nuclear modular plants um, as a kind of alternative where they would be built almost like in a factory and then r rather than having the kind of construction that you do now um, at our last meeting, this, I'm on the Secretary of Energy Advisory Board, that was a, a topic of, of discussion. Uh, but we will face in a way your question because Nuclear plants, when they're first established, have a 40-year lifetime, then pretty clearly get a 20-year extension. The next 20, but they get a, a heavily upgraded in the course of that. I mean, they're not everything, so many things get changed. The next 20 years, then there starts to be a, a, a question, at least I hear people saying, about just will the economics work to um, retrofit them again uh, so that they can go 80 years. So I think in a way what you're raising is a question that will start to come on the agenda in the next five or seven years. And um, I think renewables clearly are going to grow, very important role, but um, um, there's a gap that would have to be filled. Oh, right here, I promise you. Um, related to that, given the challenges of the economics behind solar and wind, um, are there sustainable policies that um, governments could implement to help us at least diversify our energy portfolio a little bit more? I, mean, I think everyone's aware of some of the policies that have risen and that squashed, but are, do you have some um, thoughts about what policies might be more effective? Well, I think that um, uh, I have the, I mean, it was Germany really that's responsible for the rebirth of the, of the renewable industry starting in the 1990s. The, and there they did it with what are called feed-in tariffs, which kind of blend the high cost of renewables, so they're blended to the overall electric price and people don't really see it, and so it gets the industry going. Um, we do two things in this country. One is the tax incentives, uh, which exist, and uh, we have different, the tax incentives that uh, Jim Delson was trying to get on that uh, Tehachapi Ridge in 1981 were based upon just capacity, uh, but now it's based upon how much electricity you produce. So, and then the other thing I think that's very significant is the, the portfolio standards that the states have. And that really, that is a huge driver. I mean, Jerry Brown in California has just signed a, a bill a couple months ago saying that California will get one third of its electricity from renewable by 2020. Very ambitious goal, in a, particularly in a state with 12% unemployment. But nevertheless, uh, 
directionally it tells you where it's going to go. So I think those are the kind of affected decisions that get made and probably, you know, what's really actually accelerated uh, wind and solar. Um, and the idea is that the more you have, you, you bring down the costs. So I think those are the kind of policies. I think in this era of fiscal austerity, we're not going to see a lot of new policies. We'll see retrenchment. And one thing I worry about is what happens to the basic research and development budgets and just maintaining their integrity uh, through this, what might be a very stringent period. We'll wait, then we'll come around and then. Um, as the, the cost for different co-gen technologies out there, you know, mom and pa can go buy uh, solar panels, put them on their roof, and, and there's the fuel cell. As, as that becomes more cost effective, do you, when do you think that uh, that type of energy source will become a significant part of the grid, or, or will it ever? Is it just well, I think like I think wind is kind of um, in the last few years before the downturn, you know, a significant part of the new capacity being put in was wind, and so wind is 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 much larger than solar. I think solar. It's clearly grown a lot. It's a global business, but just look at the percentages. It's still very small, and uh, still it's a question of you know of getting the cost down. Where these can compete without subsidies and incentives, and uh, but that's the name of the of the you know that's the name of the game. And I see it just so much on solar. It's, it's all finding new ways to bring down the cost. Wind is a business that's already kind of dominated by you know, the Siemens and the General Electrics and the Vestuses. So it's already, and of course, there too you see the Chinese companies, you know, the question, of, they're clearly global leaders in, in solar now in production. What their role will be in the wind business is something on the mind of everybody in the wind business. Do you see telepresence playing a big role in the efficiency of fuel? Uh, so that we don't have to travel? Right. Yeah. Uh, probably, yeah. I, uh, yeah. I mean, is that something you all work on here? And <laughs> yeah. I mean, we had uh, we had Steve Bomber at our conference in March, and uh, he certainly was demonstrating and talking about it. And do you know of any data that exists on its effect today? Or I don't. Um, I don't. Um, you, you, somebody probably in the room does. Does somebody work? Does anybody here have a handle on that? With like the potential impact of telepresence on reducing travel? Yeah. Like how many people are watching this and we're all seeing there's not going to have a security. Absolutely. Yeah. He's not going to share it with you. But yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think. Uh, you. Um, so what's your, can you share your unvarnished thoughts on carbon ca capture and storage? Yes, uh, carbon capture and storage, the notion is that you capture the carbon one way or the other out of a, uh, out of a power plant, uh, uh, compress it, transport it, and bury it somewhere. And, you know, you do the numbers and you come to the conclusion is that you would, it would be as though you're creating a whole new energy industry that works in reverse, that goes backwards. <laughs> and the system we had is, what is it, 150 years old or however you want to say. So, uh, and at least at this point, uh, it's, you know, you don't have any really significant demonstration projects of it. And the cost of it is uh, people send it, by dad, 75% or 100% to cost. So there are some people, you know, clearly it's one of those things people are working on and committed to and trying to make it work, and at least it may be part of the solution, but it's hard to imagine it on a huge scale. And then the question is, once you bury uh, the CO2, who owns it? Who's responsible for it? What happens if there's a leak? And, you know, you can, I'm on this commission that we're reporting to President Obama on shale gas, and we know the controversy around that. So, so I think there's this whole other, the whole legal side of it is still uh, unclear. So I guess would say it's kind of part of the mix and people will do it and some projects may be built that way, but we're far, far, far from seeing it as something of large scale. Sounds like it's as far off as 
hydrogen economy to some extent. Well, I, I, I don't know in chronology where to put it, but you know, uh, as John Deutsch of MIT says, you need a couple of significant demonstration projects first, and we're not there yet. And so that's the kind of first gating item that you have to get through. Well, thank you. It's um, great to be here. Uh, I enjoyed it. Thank you very much, and everybody who's viewing this. And uh, uh, you know, if you offer, I'll take you up on a ride in your uh, in, in your leaf to the airport. So thank you very much, and <laughs> glad to be here with you all. Thank you. Thanks a lot.